Providers Transformation Assembly um, to kick things off. Um, healthcare is evolving rapidly, becoming more digital. So what industry trends are you guys keeping an eye on? So I think probably one of the most important uh, kind of healthcare industry trends that we keep our eye on right now is the emergence of both consumer generated data, so wearables, everyone has an Apple Watch or Android Wear or a Fitbit. Um, a lot of healthcare systems, providers, health insurance companies are trying to figure out how to leverage that data to evaluate patient activation, adherence to care plans, things of that nature. So that's a, that's a really big part of the, the industry trends that we're following. I think secondarily, or, or and not necessarily a, a second nature of equal importance is the integration of social determinants of health data. Um, a lot of the early ACOs cut their teeth on helping to identify how to reduce utilization in skilled nursing facilities, how to reduce overutilization of tests, um, steer patients into network. And as you see the original group of ACOs moving into renewals, whether that be a track one plus or shaking on more risk sharing or moving into a next gen, you're starting to see the emergence of telehealth, not just for physical health, but the integration of behavioral health. Teladoc is doing some really interesting work there but also looking at how do you identify these cohorts of patients and their behavior that's influenced by their psychosocial conditions. So do patients live in a food desert? Are they, uh, are they living uh, without access to transportation? So when a facility is calling to remind a patient of an appointment, do they need to coordinate with Uber or Lyft to get a ride to that appointment? So how do you drive better patient activation and inclusion in the healthcare system? So a lot of trends, not only about the data that's coming in from what we generate, uh, but also how do you better use the, the patient's kind of home conditions to tailor care to them personally. Yeah, that was really interesting. So what are the biggest challenges that you think the industry's facing right now? Uh, I mean, I think the biggest challenge right now is a lot of uncertainty. There's this massive shift of risk from the health plans out into the provider networks. You have the formation of clinical integrated networks. You have groups forming ACOs and taking on commercial risk and Medicare risk and a lot of states right now through 1115 waivers um, and through state innovation models are redesigning Medicaid. And I think that as you start to look at groups like Medicaid populations taking risk, there's a, a, a lot of uncertainty as to what's going to happen with Washington and the new administration. Is that trend going to continue? Is it going to halt? All of these things require investment and you know, like any investment in healthcare, it's not small investment. So there's a little bit of an uncertainty of, are we gonna go spend millions of dollars building the foundation to take care of a Medicare population and in five years or in a year or in 90 days in some cases, is that gonna be squandered investment? So I think there's a little bit of paralysis there in terms of how do you effectively decide where to invest. And then I think at the same time, you have the challenge that everyone is competing for budget share right now. EMRs need to be optimized. There's upgrades. You have this market of, you know, do we go to Epic? Do we go to Cerner? Do we do something else? What's going to be the next big disruption? So I think there's a lot of discussion around what's happening in the, the market broadly um, as it relates to technology. Um, so population health management is another huge trend that we've been talking about during the event. Sure. So, um, what is so exciting about the potential impact of this on healthcare? Well, you know, it's really interesting because people talk about population health, but I think one of the biggest challenges of the last five years is what does it really mean? How do you define it? And I think we're finally getting to a point where you can define it. There's population health as it relates to the population as it exists between a population of individuals and a health system. There's the population health as it is between a provider and their impaneled group of patients. And then there's population health with the population of one, the relationship between myself and my primary care physician. And I think you see a lot of vendors emerging to help capitalize on all of those different groups. So there's a, there, it's exciting because there's, there's room for multiple market players and there's a lot of innovation. You know, telehealth, I mentioned earlier, is a really exciting part of how do you manage populations at scale. Everyone in every industry, not just healthcare, is being challenged to do more with less. And so virtualization, the ability to have a telemedicine visit for an ear infection as opposed to someone going to the doctor, not only drives convenience and, and patient satisfaction for you know maybe a mother with a child who has an ear infection who can't get out of work in business hours, so it helps there. But then I think there's a lot of excitement around just kind of advanced topics of pop health. It's not just who are my patients who are overdue for a breast cancer screen. Now it's answering the question of who are those patients who have significant mental illness who also have COPD and diabetes, and how do we use the fact that they have depression or anxiety 
to predict that they're more likely to miss their appointment so you can engage with them earlier on. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of interesting research that's come up in the last probably two to five years based on the data sets we've aggregated. So population health is really kind of moving into a more mature market uh, where you have a lot more insight into how to use the data that's been generated, not just the data that's been generated from EMRs, but actually the early results of Pop Health to influence what Pop Health 3.0 is. It's interesting how you mentioned telehealth. We've been talking to a couple of our delegates as well during our time here, and they've all mentioned telehealth. And um, it, we talk about how it's people think it's limited to just sort of um, the patient who lives remotely getting a video conference with their doctor, but actually sure. there's a whole load more to it, and it's really, really interesting that you picked that up. It's it's incredible. I mean, telehealth is a huge game changer. I uh, so I live in Boston. My mm -hmm. PCP is in Boston. I love my PCP, but I spend four to five days a week outside of Boston. And Murphy's Law, if I'm going to get sick, I'm going to get sick somewhere where I don't have access to my PCP. It used to be finding an urgent care, and I'm not kidding you, I've been to urgent care in Joplin, Missouri, I've been to urgent care in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, but they don't have access to my records. Yeah. Uh, my organization, my company recently, uh, through Blue Cross of Mass, got access to a telemedicine program. I can contact them either via phone call or video conference, and they have access to my full medical record, my claims history. So when I call them and I say, hey, you know, I've got a sore throat, they'll see that six months ago I had tonsillitis, and they might say, well, hey, it might just not, it might not just be a sore throat, it might be a resurgence of tonsillitis, let's look at X, Y, and Z. I think at the same time, what's really interesting is they're starting to carve in behavioral health into telemedicine, which is starting to destigmatize access to behavioral health services, which has been a, a really big challenge. You know, when you think about the fact that, you know, anywhere between one and one to two and five individuals suffer from some sort of behavioral condition, whether it be depression, anxiety, one of those things, there's been a huge social stigma about getting access to services, especially for men. So if you can remove the fact that you have to leave your office or leave your place of work and go into a psychiatrist's office or a uh, another facility where someone might mm. see you, they might see your car parked in front of it, and you can have a conversation on the phone over 30 minutes. It helps the masses get access to behavioral health care, which they so desperately need, mm. and can be so incrementally valuable to managing physical health. So I think this, this whole trend around behavioral health and the integration of telemedicine is really going to be a game changer and for how people manage their own conditions. Yeah, it sounds like something to keep an eye on. Um, so, um, what you've been, so what differentiates your offering, Arcadia Health, from other people within this space? So I think one of the biggest challenges is we've started to create more and more data. Like everyone talks about big data in this space as cat videos on the internet and like, what are you going to do with all the facts that, you know, you've got so many people watching cat videos. And that's what they think of when they think of big data. What we're doing in healthcare is we are creating immense amounts of data every day. Not just that a patient came in and they had a blood pressure measurement, but like at home, I have a scale that I step on that's connected to Bluetooth to my watch, which is connected to my Apple Health Kit, that SAG tracks my weight over time. The value of that data in my electronic health record is so critically important. The same thing happens when I go see a specialist or I go have an ultrasound or, or, or. And what we do that I think is helping our customers really understand the full potential of how to manage their population is we go out and we grab all of those different data sets of data and we're vendor agnostic. We don't care if you're on Epic or on Meditech or on Cerner or you built your own health record yourself. We are solving that problem and taking that headache away from CIOs so that the questions that their teams can start to answer are automatically based on a foundation of data that they can trust. And we spend a lot of time not only on the technology side, helping to facilitate that data exchange, but then we go out and we sit with providers in the community and we make sure that, hey, I think Michael has these three conditions and I think these are the last three encounters he had. Do you believe that based on what you see in your electronic medical record? And they validate it. So at the same time that we're tackling this technology challenge, we're tackling the physician trust challenge, which means that when you put a report in front of a provider, they automatically believe it a little bit more. I'm not going to say they always believe it, but a little bit more. Yeah. Well, I think that's really smart because we've been talking a lot about how we sort of, in many industries, not just in healthcare, become sort of data rich and knowledge poor, but actually that's collecting the data to provide knowledge. That's right. one of the few examples that we've had at several of our events, actually, that's a practical example of how to do that. I think that that's a really interesting point is there is so much data. Mm. But how do you turn that data into information and impactful information? What is, what is the question you're trying to answer? You know, and, and you know, Arcadia is not going to answer all of the questions. You, know, you have really interesting data providers out there. You know, IBM Watson Health is doing 
really interesting research around oncology and genomics care pathways. Flatiron Health is doing something similar. So you have all these hyper-focused organizations going in and trying to answer very critical questions that'll change the way that we treat cancer and answer personalized medicine. And it's such an exciting time for healthcare with data because unlike managed care in the 80s and 90s where we tried to fix the problems we have in healthcare, the difference today is we have all of this data and we have companies like ours who can help harness this data to make it more impactful for the care providers. Perfect. So you've been working with us at Millennium Alliance for a long time, sponsoring 10 of our healthcare provider and payer assemblies in total. So what do you see as the biggest benefit to sponsoring a Millennium Alliance event? I think there are you know two primary tr two primary kind of drivers of value for for Arcadia in particular. The first is you guys get us access to a, a series of delegates that when you look at your competition, who I won't name, uh, <laughs> you guys get a higher quality of delegate. You get delegates who want to be here. They're not here just because they get a free trip to Nashville or wherever. They're here because they want to meet their peers. They want to meet their colleagues, and they want to meet us. I had a, a conversation this morning with a an IDN from uh, the Midwest, and they said, you know. I really love the fact that I can interact with other peers who are dealing with the same challenges that I am, and then in a very controlled setting, talk to the vendors that I want to talk to. And I think that you guys take a lot of care and time in matching us up with the, the individuals on the delegate side who mm -hmm. care about us. And you know, out of the, you know, the 10 meetings I'll have today and the three or four ancillaries, I would probably say that every one of them is a meaningful conversation. Every one of them may not result in a follow-up, but there's a ton of learning. I learn about what my competitors are doing, where they're falling down, how I can do things better. Um, so there's a lot of learning that you can get at, outside of just the opportunity to drive sales. Oh, perfect. So has, has working with us sort of expedited your sales process? It has. You know, I think that that's the thing that's really interesting. The first couple of, of assemblies that I joined or I attended, it was a lot about initiating relationships and starting the sales cycle. A lot of the technology purchases in healthcare today go through standard buying cycles, requests for proposals or for information. They take a long time, eight to 12 months. What these assemblies give me the opportunity to do is to check in with key stakeholders and those who may not be driving the buying process, but are influencers. And I can start to understand, you know, where do we stand? How are we faring? What could we do better? You know, and, and understanding that piece of it. And then it, at the same time, it is accelerating. It gives me a chance to sit down without the, the kind of the mayhem or the chaos of the day-to-day, -day, you know, hospital management or health plan management so that we can have a conversation around how do we, how do we make sure that we are matching up appropriately to the, to the needs of that organization. So with that in mind, how many deals have you got from our events? In other words, ROI. Uh, that's a good question. Uh, we got one deal, uh, our largest analytics deal ever from one of your guys' events, uh, okay. which was really yeah. exciting. We papered that at the end of last year. And the funniest thing, uh, which may or be a good thing or a bad thing, is uh, it was not a scheduled meeting. It was someone I sat next to at lunch at one of your sessions. Oh. Um, she had actually rejected meeting with us uh, in her delegate meeting form. Um, and we sat down and we were having lunch and she just said, I'm, I'm so tired of talking about data, healthcare, all the things. And I happened to know she was reading a book that I was reading at the same time. Uh, it was a World War II fiction book. And so we started talking about World War II fiction and how we have this sick obsession about reading books that make us cry um, because our jobs don't make us cry enough. And she ended up inviting me up to, to visit her. And we you know, went through about a year long process and structured buying process and brought them on as a client. And I would not have had that interaction without this forum. And I think that that's a, you know, a really key value driver. The one-on-one -on -one meetings are super critical, but you will get the most out of these summits if you maximize every networking opportunity. Well, yeah, as you've proven. So how does uh, working with the Millennium Alliance team before the event, for example, with the Needs Analysis Workbook, um, just help you guys out on site? I mean, I think it's, it's really interesting because, you know, so we take, we take your entire Needs Analysis Workbook, we load that into our Salesforce instance. So whether, you know, we have something comes out of the 10 meetings we have, we also get this huge set of data on, you know, how many delegates are here? 100 delegates today? Um, it's probably about 55 oh. actual delegates, um, and then there's the thought leaders and our analyst partners and stuff like that on top of that. Great. So, you know, between 50 and 75 kind of industry leaders that now I have a whole set of data on. So if I can't meet with someone here, if I can't catch them at a lunch, if I can't catch them in a one-on-one -on -one meeting, I now have the fodder I need to go say, I'm going to make a phone call and be like, hey, I saw that EHR data aggregation and analytics was one of your key topics. Let's talk about that. What are you doing? How can I help you? And we have this connection that, oh, I saw you at the Millennium Alliance Assembly. I saw you speak. I heard you on a panel, things like that. So it gives me that connection to that open door. And I also find that your guys' team is really helpful if I say, hey, this person's not on my schedule. I'd really like five minutes with them. Most of the time I can get them here. But there have been countless times where Jesse or, or Rob will say, let me get you a follow-up call with yeah. them a week later. Mm -hmm. 
And so you guys are, you know, uh, an adjunct to my own inside team helping me generate meetings. And when I have a hard time after the, after the assembly is getting someone on the phone, you guys know they're admins, you have a relationship, you can do what a lot of times I can't, which is get me that follow-up meeting. And a lot of times they're not calling me back because they don't want to, it's just because they're busy and they don't know who I am, they don't remember my name, they don't know my email address, I'm going to their spam folder. You negate all that and help accelerate that, that interaction. That's wonderful. Um, so why do you choose us over other similar companies in the space? Um, I, so I think there's a couple things. I mean, frankly, we, we work with a number of companies in the space. Uh, you know, diversification is key here. They all attract different audiences. I would say that your guys' audience are generally of a higher caliber. You're attracting a, a more executive audience. Your thought leaders are bringing new ideas to the table. They're helping shape and drive the industry. And so we, we like that here. You have decision makers. And frankly, the next step most of the time with, with our one-on-one -on -one meetings is great, I want to take you and to put you in touch with someone who reports to me, who runs this, and you get that connection of a CEO or a COO saying, go talk to this person because they own this and it's their endorsement and that helps accelerate my sales cycle. Whereas with other events, I might be with that next level down where they can move things, but without the stamp of their CEO, it's not going to move as fast. Cool. Um, so tell us like sort of like the top three reasons why you sponsor our events. Um, I mean, I like the flexibility. Working with your guys' team has been fantastic. Rob and Jesse and the other kind of delegate service um, and kind of service provider partners have been really fantastic to work with. You know, anytime we have a question about, hey, I, I don't want to meet with this person because it looks like they were filler or they didn't rank, they rank us, there's always a ton of responsiveness. I came to this, uh, to this assembly and I asked for, you know, four supplemental meetings. I have all of them. You know, and it's it's outside of the ten that I've been contracted with. I think you know part of it is because we've been working with you guys for so long, and you know you guys understand that I want to continue to work with you guys. But there's a lot of willingness to make sure that as solution providers, we're getting the most value out of these sessions. And then I think secondarily, Rob and his team are always really willing to look at and test new ideas with us. You know, we did a a, a series of experiments last year with how do we change the copy in your guys' needs analysis workbook? How do we tweak the words and how do we see if that drives better better engagement? Having the full visibility of who of your delegates want to meet with us versus those that we want to meet with helps us better align who we want to, you know, actually focus those one-on-one -on -one meetings in on with. Perfect. Um, so, the last question, what advice would you give to companies who are watching this video thinking they want to sponsor one of our events, um, what advice would you give them? You know, it's the same advice that I give almost everyone, is you get out of these things what you put into them. So if you show up the day of the assembly and you get your packet and you don't know anything about who you're meeting with, if you don't go on LinkedIn and find out who you know, ask your friends who've worked with these organizations, you're going to get less value than if you put some time into it. Um, one of the things that we started doing as an organization is we get our list of the folks who we're going to meet with you know, a couple days in advance and I have my admins start calling and saying, hey, I want 10 minutes. You wanted to meet with me. What do you want to talk about so that instead of a generalized pitch that I'm going to give in 30 minutes, I can get the who or Katie is out of the way and we can start to dig into this is the problem you have. Let's start to solution around the, you know, how do we build that solution. Um, so that's one of the things that's been super successful for us. It gets the pleasantries out of the way. Um, and I think that follow-up is really, really important. You know, all these people here are busy. They're taking, you know, a day and a half out of their schedule, two days if they're traveling. You know, how do you make sure that you are get, cutting to the chase, getting to the point, and understanding who the right person to follow up with is? A lot of times, you know, people want the follow-up with the CEO. Mm. I'm happy to talk to the CEO again, but if the CEO says, the person owning my data strategy is my, you know, uh, VP of Population Health, great. Can you make an intro? Can I ghost write an email for you? How do I make it easy for that person I'm meeting with to make sure that when they leave, they have the tool they need to get me to the right person who's going to engage with me?